So, hello everyone. I warmly uh, welcome you all to this webinar on hysteria outbreaks and thank you for your participation. It is great to have you with us. I would just like to say that our colleagues, Mr. Tarabella, will not be able to join us. His duties as a mayor are keeping him away. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from victims of listeriosis as well as experts in the fields. As you may know, listeria is one of the most dangerous bacteria that can be found in food. It causes listeriosis, an infection that is particularly dangerous for at-risk groups like pregnant women, newborn, adults above 65 years, and age and persons with weak uh, immune system. For them, being infected with this bacteria can be a matter of life and death. In the last couple of years, there have been several outbreaks across the EU. The most recent ones happened last year in Spain, Germany and in the Netherlands. They led to more than a thousand infections and dozens of deaths, miscarriages and lifelong health problems. Unfortunately, this disease, even if cured, has lifelong impacts both psychologically and physically. Anti uh, antibiotics are often key to treating bacterial infections, but antimicrobial resistance is on the rise. As I'm sure you are all aware, so we must find and use alternatives. And in the context of a global pandemic, Bacterial infections like listeriosis can become even more problematic because our health system uh, are under high pressure. So prevention is also key. Bacteriophages are one, are one such alternative that can prevent disease outbreaks. They are the natural predator of bacteria and do not contribute to end uh, to an increase in antibiotic resistance. By treating foods with bacteriophages, which are at particular risk of carrying listeria, such as ready-to-eat meat, we could effectively reduce the rate of listeriosis occurrence by 70 to 80 percent. I think this is a very interesting option for prevention of the disease. And prevention is absolutely vital in the case of listeriosis. We will now have the opportunity to hear the testimony of two people affected by this dangerous illness. To demonstrate what the effect can be of listeria contamination, we have two short videos recordings of people who survived a listeriosis infection. Um, the first is uh, from Mr. van der Pels, who sadly passed away earlier this year at the age of 80. The video was record, uh, recorded two years ago, but he was infected in his early 60s. Until his death, Mr. van der Pels had to live with the consequences of listeriosis. We will watch this story, his stories first now. I had listeria. I was sent to hospital because, well, I, I, I gave up all the, all the food and uh, drink, so I had to have injections with, uh, with water or I don't know what it did. It was, well, if you put everything together, I was uh, hospitalized for half a year. All kinds of headache, splitting headache, and also in my back and in all, all the muscles were stiff. I lost my job because um, I couldn't uh, I couldn't concentrate anymore, and so on. Yeah, so, and and that then I had to go home, and that was a very a very. Uh, I liked my work, and 
Yeah, it, it, it stopped. I have trouble with my balance. And And I have trouble in finding my words. I use, by walking, I have these Nordic uh, walking sticks. If I don't use them, I top over. Because sometimes it is just like I have cotton wool in my head. I'm still happy that I'm there, but lots of people died of it. Yes, we are happy together. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it makes a difference, it makes a big difference before and after the illness. Yes, and next is the testimony of a young mother and father in Germany who almost lost their baby at birth following a Listeria infection. They told their story to an NDE TV program, program last year, and we are grateful that we can use part of this footage. Diese Freude, dass er einfach da ist, die überwältigt einen immer wieder aufs Neue, muss ich ehrlich sagen. Und ähm, ich kann es nicht ausdrücken, aber es ist einfach wunderschön zu wissen, dass es geschafft hat und auch zu wissen, dass ich nicht schuld bin, dass er vielleicht nicht mehr da ist. Ich, ich habe gedacht, ich habe eine Grippe oder krieg eine Grippe. Ich habe mich ganz schlapp gefühlt und habe Fieber bekommen und Schüttelfrost und war wirklich richtig, richtig müde. Da habe ich gesagt, nee, du musst ganz schnell herkommen. Ich glaube, das Kind kommt. Der ganze Körper war ganz blass und reglos. Das Krasseste war eigentlich, dass er dann gesagt hat, ähm, der Oberarzt so, sie müssen sich mit dem Gedanken abfinden, dass er morgen eventuell nie mehr da ist. Ähm, weil äh, er hat jetzt Entzündungswerte von 200 und sagt dann, wir haben schwerkranke Kinder hier liegen, schwerkranke, die haben so 70. Natürlich achtet man auf seine Ernährung, das macht man instinktiv. Man, man weiß, dass rohe Fleisch, rohes, äh, rohe Fisch, sämtliche Rohmilchprodukte etc. Überträger sind von ähm, vielen schlimmen Keimen. Wenn man betroffen ist, die Ungewissheit hat, die ganze Angstphase durchmacht, nicht weiß, was wird, vielleicht sein Kind dafür einbüßen muss und ein Leben lang mit Trauer äh, umgehen muss, kann ich das nicht verstehen. Wenn es da die Möglichkeit gibt, das zu nutzen, was nachweislich hilft, das einzudämmen. Noch natürlich, dazu biologisch, ne? Noch also. dazu biologisch, genau, nicht chemisch. Warum sollte man das nicht nehmen? Yes. After these two very moving videos, we will now listen to what experts have to say on the matter. I'm pleased to give the floor to Mrs. Sirpa Pietikainen, member of the European Parliament from Finland for the European People's Party Group. She is a substitute member in the ENVI Committee and the former Minister of Environment of Finland. Sirpa, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Saravin, and my good colleague for opening up and co-hosting this seminar. I think it is of utmost importance that we raise this topic on the European level for three reasons. One uh, is the fact what we know after the coronavirus. We need more and better European health issues to be effective and to protect our citizens and to uh, uh, create effective health policies. The second is what we heard from these two uh, interventions and we know from Listeria and Listeriosis. It is a serious disease and it is among us. Uh, there was, um, uh, Sarah, you mentioned a couple of, uh, of the infections, outbreaks, what we have had in last years. Indeed, yes, we have had them in Finland too. And for example, in elderly care house, where it took one third of the patient, uh, people living there uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 to, to pre uh, premature death after very severe 
uh, outbreak of the infection. Always it doesn't happen like that, but it can happen. It is deadly disease. And if you can, as it was said in the video, if you can cure it, if you can prevent, if you have new technologies and knowledge, why don't we use it? And then the third point is the fake uh, 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 treatments and uh, the whole uh, uprise uh, of uh, the possibilities of you using better fake uh, uh, therapies in different fields of the health and um, uh, health uh, and sickness, illness area. And this is very promising new avenue also when it comes to listeriosis. With these words, uh, wholeheartedly on my behalf, welcome to, um, to our uh, uh, webinar. And uh, now I would turn to our real specialists and our panelists. <coughs> and just would like to remind you that uh, <coughs> sorry, we will have the Q&A on the end of the, uh, the uh, two panels. And our first panelist, welcome, is Mr. Uh, Willem Paul uh, de Moy. Uh, you, you are editor in chief of uh, VMT that provides professional information for food professional uh, in the food, drinks, and beverage industry in Netherlands and Belgium through different kind of uh, publications, websites, newsletters, books, and meetings. And at the VMT. Uh, uh, you, William Paul, uh, is uh, in charge of legislation and supervision, and you write a lot about uh, food safety and product development. And uh, now you will be talking uh, about listeriosis prevention uh, to us and what is the situation in the EU. And now, Paul, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, so uh, again, my uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Willem Paul de Mooy, uh, editor in chief of uh, VMT, and we mainly write about food safety issues in the in industry, food industry. So um, of course, we already heard that listeria, pat listeria pathogen is one of the most persistent food safety problems in the food industry. We saw this, for example, last year with the outbreak of listeriosis in the Netherlands uh, and Belgium. Um, and, and this outbreak could be traced back to a specific factory of uh, Offerman meat in the Netherlands. So the authorities used the whole genome sequencing technology for this to trace this back. And this case uh, showed that it, this is specific listeria type um, that had been present in this uh, uh, factory for many years. So for the public, it meant that, yeah, of course, we already hear, heard that uh, listeriosis is a serious illness. For industry, um, yeah, it can mean that it can eliminate your business if you uh, don't uh, tackle this. So as a magazine for food industry in the Netherlands, we visited uh, many, fa many factories, for example, producers of meat uh, and ready to eat products. And we speak to uh, quality assurance managers in factories, and they always tell us it's an ongoing battle against listeria. For example, I visited a processing plant uh, for fresh salmon. So they uh, developed their own procedures to overcome listeria with a delicate cleaning procedure. Uh, for example, the use of uh, low pressure water, um, so you don't spread the listeria uh, bacteria bacteria uh, through uh, the whole uh, area. And uh, they do this in combination with dry disinfection of the whole area. So this is um, about the cleaning, but in a battle um, against listeria, you lo always look for better weapons. So the most important ones are like cleaning, disinfection of the factory and the production itself. But what when listeria is present on uh, raw material like beef and fish, uh, etc. So it comes into your factory and it's already there. How do you ov overcome that? So you need to do tests uh, or carry out challenge tests, etc. So what we see is that, that it's virtually impossible to avoid uh, listeria bacteria, even in the most hygienic and safest production facilities. So it's very persistent and it's uh, like always there. Every factory has got its own uh, uh, zoo. So you have to maintain the zoo very uh, well. 
So it's required to prevent the outgrowth of these bacteria above the maximum allowed levels in your uh, end product. So for many years, uh, we already know that the uh, already mentioned fakes are very effective weapons against Listeria um, or against other pathogens. You need different fakes. So we receive many si signals from industry regarding the immediate use of these fakes, both to protect the consumer and uh, the producer itself. But uh, OK, then we have the, uh, the authorities of the European countries. They don't allow the use of fakes in fresh food products. So national food safety authorities, for example, in the Netherlands, where I live, um, they tend to think that producers see the application of fakes as a, as a guarantee. So, OK, uh, the industry tells us uh, this is not the case. It's absolutely, absolutely not a guarantee or a cover up for a poor cleaning in the factory. So they tell us they see it as an extra tool and an extra huge hurdle for pathogen to develop in the product. So industry is waiting for about 12 years now for approval in Europe. Um, in US, the fakes are already in use since uh, 2006, and we wonder uh, how this uh, can uh, could happen. So of course, we know that there is an ongoing discussion in, in, uh, in politics um, and with the experts uh, on how uh, the fakes should be used. Uh, should they be used as a de decontaminant or as a non-decontaminating process aid? So um, I'm not very familiar with the legal process for such issues, but we think the well, I think the precautionary principle we have in Europe um, can be used in the wrong way. And I think uh, with Listeria, uh, it is used in the wrong way. There's nothing wrong with the precautionary principle itself, but sometimes it can be used as a political emergency break. So um, they say better safe than sorry. And the precautionary principle, as you know, and uh, enables decision makers to adopt uh, precautionary measures when scientific evidence about an environmental or human health hazard is uncertain and the stakes are high. But uh, it can also uh, be used uh, too quickly, I think, and uh, or convulsive. Uh, so this can have negative consequences. There is no uncertainty in the case of fakes, uh, we found. Uh, a lot of scientific evidence was already there and also a proven safe use in the US, like I mentioned, and some other countries. Um, but yeah, according to me, it seems there are people who don't want it and they uh, seem to have uh, a loud voice. So yeah, uh, in the end, I also think the long procedure has to do with maybe a lack of knowledge or a sub subsequent fear of taking res responsibility to approve the use of fakes. I don't know. Um, European Court um, of Justice uh, enables the use of natural uh, uh, fakes against Listeria. They did this in October 2019, but it's still not nationally implemented. So industry is uh, waiting uh, very long and complaining. So that's what we hear uh, throughout the field all the time. Um, well, last statements I would like to make is, of course, the application of fakes uh, needs to be thoroughly tested, tested and proven to be safe. Of course, also uh, we and the industry have questions like um, fakes do not walk around and they have to land on a uh, pathogen like Listeria it's very specifically. So. My question is, how many fakes do you need then? And what does it cost to treat the whole product? Because the fakes need to go everywhere to kill all the listeria. Um, we also have questions about uh, certain products. For example, raw milk cheese. Can you use it there? Because listeria can be in the product rather than on the surface of a product. So can fakes be eff effective there? Uh, another question would be how quickly pathogens become resistant against these fakes. Um, we, we might use a cocktail of viruses to prevent resistance. Um, and it's not only my question, but also a question of the industry. So another question would be literally fakes are viruses, viruses who attack pathogens, not humans, but still. Can this harm the image of the food industry? Maybe. 
Um, so may that be a concern of the EU? So maybe that uh, a hidden reason why, uh, well, well, there is, uh, yeah, he people hesitate to implement it. So my conclusion for now would be uh, industry really longs for a bit of transparency uh, on this subject. There's uh, not a clear and convincing answer of the EU uh, on why fakes aren't still permitted. Industry is afraid to stake uh, to take steps by itself, uh, and they are dependent on the national authorities, of course. So uh, this is uh, what I uh, would like to say about this subject. Thank you very much for interesting uh, introduction for our discussion, uh, Willem. And our next speaker is Mr. Spiros Papas. Uh, he is currently managing partner of the law firm Papas and Associates uh, in Brussels and Athens, and uh, a former director general for consumer policy of the European Commission. So you're very familiar with uh, the environments we are working here with the politics. And uh, you have a vast experience in um, among other issues on health and consumer policy. And now you will share um, with us your views on how to ensure a high level of a human health protection according to the Treaty of the, fu uh, of the Function of the European Union and what are the grounds that we could be more effective there in, in these least areas cases too. So Spires, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, allow me first to uh, share with you a reaction on what we have just seen because it was for me also the first time I got uh, a, a feeling with victims of uh, uh, listeriosis. It is really shocking. It is shocking, in particular if one thinks uh, 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 just in case uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an event or an outbreak of listeriosis nowadays uh, in parallel to the coronavirus. Uh, pandemic, you can imagine uh, uh, how catastrophic it will become. Anyway, coming back to uh, our uh, discussion, I would like uh, to say very simply that uh, public health uh, is not uh, a competence of the, un of the European Union, uh, strictly speaking. Now, having said that, uh, I should uh, explain that uh, this is rather an oversimplification, uh, this statement. Why? Because uh, since uh, the beginning of the first European economic uh, community, public health was uh, there. Public health uh, was omnipresent. Just to give you an example, uh, uh, if there were reasons to protect public health, the fundamental liberty of free movement of, of goods uh, uh, could be overruled, and so on and so forth. There were several derogations on grounds of public health. However, the first time public health became uh, uh, separate, distinct in uh, uh, the Treaty of uh, the European Union was uh, on the occasion of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, when it was introduced uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as a, a, an article in the treaty uh, aiming at the protection of uh, high-level uh, uh, public health. Uh, this was uh, uh, an important uh, development, of course, because it gave uh, the Commission the possibility to interfere with the member states. Likewise, with uh, uh, the following uh, Treaty of uh, Amsterdam, when uh, uh, this uh, uh, article uh, was reinforced, uh, and nowadays uh, public health uh, is uh, what? Is it a competence? No. With uh, the clarification uh, uh, given by the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, public health belongs uh, to what we call actions of the Union aiming again at uh, safeguarding uh, a high level of uh, public health. It is an action. Is it uh, uh, something inferior to uh, uh, than being a competence? 
uh, the answer to this question is uh, uh, not easy. It is complex. From one point of view, an action gives full liberty to the union to interfere without uh, restrictions. This is very important. An action might be everything. And uh, the treaty is quite uh, favorable towards uh, such an interpretation. Now, when you have a competence, we are bound to the concrete uh, prescriptions uh, of uh, uh, this competence to the conditions that uh, go along with uh, uh, the competence. Therefore, I would say as a first point that uh, having uh, such an action as an obligation, the European Union is allowed, is entitled to intervene in order to protect uh, public health by all means. Now, uh, the story is not uh, 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 all because uh, public health is more than an action according to the treaty itself when it comes uh, to uh, uh, common uh, safety concerns uh, by derogation the uh, European Commission acquires the possibility the competence to issue legislative uh, uh, acts uh, either directives or regulations uh, this is what we call a shared competence a competence that once it is uh, exerted assumed by the European Union, then it uh, uh, overrules or it prevails over any national uh, uh, legislation. So you have uh, uh, until now, I repeat, uh, the possibility for the Union to act uh, uh, under the hat of an action or under the hat of a shared competence, or at the end of the day, let's assume that uh, the treaty does not uh, address uh, at all uh, 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 specifically public health. Then I would say again, again, according to Article 352, the Union would be entitled to interfere in the interest of public interest. Now, you know that uh, uh, the Union law is uh, an integrated system. It is an autonomous system, independent from the national legal orders. It is a legal order that it is uh, auto-creative. Uh, there are no theoretically gaps uh, in this uh, legal order. Therefore, I would uh, conclude that uh, the present uh, legal system of the European Union, although it is not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, explicit or uh, 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 it does not uh, go to the details, still it is uh, a complete system that uh, uh, empowers uh, the European Union to interfere in the interests of the European citizens. At the end of the day, it is not a matter of law, it is a matter of public will. I, I would like to stick to that uh, and uh, I remain at your disposal for the discussion. Sorry, Mr. Peter Kynan, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but it uh, just the technology uh, sometimes is slower than I am. Uh, no problem. Thank you very Sorry, much. Sorry, do you mind if I just interject one second? Hi, I'm Jonathan Benton uh, from the Parliament Magazine. Uh, I'm managing this event. I'm just uh, right to interject to say that if you have any questions, uh, please can you submit them to the chat feature on the control panel which you'll find to your right hand side and we'll collate them there and we'll put them to the panel at the end during the Q&A session. Over to you. Thank you Chris very much for raising this issue so that uh, uh, all the people can uh, collect uh, the um, questions and send, uh, send them and we'll try to uh, uh, get in as many questions as possible. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Spiros, about your comments. Really fascinating. Uh, sort of a, uh, inspires me of thinking what the EU could have done more in the COVID 
19 case for the public health perspective too. So uh, please let me come back to you at some point on this. And I think that we should grasp this competence uh, much bolder than what we are doing at the moment uh, <coughs> in listeriosis, in pandemics in, and in many other cases to, to secure the public health. So very much food for the thought. And uh, now we will listen to Professor Frank uh, Devliegri. I hope I didn't do too much bad for pronouncing your name. And uh, you are from the Department of Food Microbiology and Preservation at Kent University uh, in Belgium. And you are leading scientist uh, in the field of food pre uh, preservation with high experience in, among others, the microbial aspects of food packing and uh, packaging atmospheres and mild uh, inactivation treatments. And now you are uh, going to talk to us about the figs and uh, the possibility, uh, if there are possible solutions to reduce the listeriosis cases. Frank, please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for giving the word and the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how fakes can possibly be a solution to reduce the listeriosis cases in, uh, in Europe. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, and uh, the next one. Thank you. What is important to realize uh, for you is that, in fact, listeria is ubiquitously present in the environment uh, everywhere but also in a processing environment. So a food company deals with raw materials that possibly may contain Listeria bacteria from nature. So when they deal with fish, meat, vegetables or fruit, it is possible that Listeria is naturally present there on this product. Secondly, it's important to realize that Listeria is able to survive in this processing environments and also colonize in these processing environments and it does this especially when the conditions are wet and cold, because at that conditions, Listeria has an advantage in comparison to other bacteria. Thirdly, I want to tell you that uh, it is indeed true, like uh, the first speaker was also saying, uh, that it is not possible by only applying good hygienic practices and hazard practices in companies to guarantee the absolute absence of Listeria monocytogenes. So it is really important to realize that in many cases uh, for producers of ready-to-eat products, it's very difficult for them to guarantee that Listeria is not present in the environment of the processing and then also possibly can come onto the foods they produce. Next slide, please. So what are fakes, in fact? Uh, so fakes could be a possible solution, and you should be aware, in fact, that fakes are the natural enemies of bacteria. So they use bacteria as, uh, as guests or as hosts, I have to say, and they will multiply in this bacteria, and for them, these bacteria are specific targets. You should be aware that every 48 hours, up to 50% of all bacteria present here on the earth are killed by fakes. So fakes are naturally abundantly present in nature and they are there also to reduce bacterial populations here on earth. Uh, they are naturally present everywhere. Just imagine in seawater, for example, there can be up to 1 billion fakes in one ml. Uh, so they are abundantly present everywhere in nature. Uh, they even outnumber the number of bacteria, so there are about 10 times more fakes than there are bacteria uh, present in the earth. Um, what is important to realize is that these uh, fakes are harmful to one specific bacterium and harmless to all the other bacteria. So they have a very, very specific target, and so there also exist fakes that are specific targeting Listeria monocytogenes cells. And these are the ones, of course, that people can use to tackle Listeria. Next slide, please. So how can we then use 
these fake solutions in the RTE, so the ready to eat uh, products production. Well, what is the aim of using such a fake solution? The aim is avoiding settling of Listeria monocytogenous cells on this ready to eat products during production processes. So we will try to avoid that Listeria can settle on a food product that is produced in a food company. Yeah? And how are we doing that? Well, we are doing that by applying this fake solution before contamination, in fact, can occur. So before cutting, slicing, packaging, for example, immediately after heating, to have a protection at the point where settling of Listeria cells may occur. Yeah? Important to realize that these fakes can only be effective when they come in contact with the Listeria cells. And when you apply this type of uh, fake solutions, you are able to reduce cell settling on food products with 90 to 90 90% of uh, effectiveness. And you can apply them on different products that have been tested already in several laboratories. And you see here some data of uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of the Technology of Zurich, where you indeed see that uh, we are reaching, let's say, between 90 and 99% of uh, reduction. Next slide, please. Here are three examples uh, where and how it, they can be used in food production. So a first example is in the production of frozen peas. Uh, remember uh, the, 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 the accident that has happened last year, uh, uh, with, or not last year, but in 2018, with frozen products. Well, frozen products are uh, blanched before freezing. And when you blanch this piece, you are killing the environment. You are killing, in fact, a lot of microorganisms which are present on the piece. And you could apply a fake solution then to protect the blanched product for Listeria coming on the product later on. Another example can be in the production of sliced cooked ham, where the solutions are applied during the slicing process, where also contamination will occur. You see on the left side there, uh, the control where the Listeria, if it was present, grows out to very high level, levels on the cooked ham, while when you apply fake solutions, you don't have this issue. And another example is in the production of smoked cured salmon, uh, where we apply this uh, fake solutions after filleting or during slicing or during packaging. Again, to protect in fact, the, the product for when Listeria settles down, that it is then also inactivated. Next slide, please. So what are then the characteristics of using this, uh, this P100, uh, so these fake solutions to control Listeria? It's important to realize these fakes are very specific active against Listeria which means that all the other microorganisms which are present on the food product are not infected, are not affected, and this means that the background flora just remains. So this means also automatically that this is not a way of masking bad hygiene, because of course you're only tackling Listeria and all the other microorganisms, other pathogens, but also sporish organisms will remain on the food product and will limit then shelf life and safety anyhow. And so it's important you only tackle Listeria, so you don't hide uh, these uh, possible bad hygiene practices. The solutions clearly offer a tool to the European food industry, allowing them to produce safe products, which are more minimally treated, ready to eat products uh, with fresh ingredients, high organoleptic quality and nutritional quality. Um, important, and these are my last words, in fact, for this talk, uh, that this technology has to be considered as an additional tool to tackle present of Listeria. So next to good manufacturing practices, good programs, and that I mean very good and, uh, cleaning and disinfection, you can use fakes uh, to avoid uh, the presence of Listeria on your produced uh, food product. Thank you very much. Oop. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Sorry, Mr. Peter, your camera is off.
Okay, now it's working. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, new information. Plus, then it seems to be that it is cost-wise doable and actually a pretty simple procedure what we could do in Europe and to ask uh, actually ask our uh, uh, food processing industry to use, which would significantly improve the uh, health, uh, uh, the the quality of the goods. Uh, concerning the listeria and the health of the people. So um, uh, now our last panelist after Frank uh, is Mr. Michael Kuhn. Uh, you are a special advisor for ecology and sustainability and education, culture and youth policy of the Commission of the uh, Bishops Conference of the European Community, or COMESE in short. Um, the Comité, among other uh, others, covers the bioethical issues that arise at the EU level in the ambits of health and research. You will share uh, your view uh, on ethics and lawmaking in the framework of listeriosis and uh, how you feel the new kind of uh, technologies, uh, if they would be taken on board. Thank you very much for. Uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, for your very warm welcome. Um, and um, I have been invited, as you already said, to give some criteria from a theological ethical perspective that may help you to ethically justify the use of fakes to combat listeriosis and to ethically assess also the European Commission's approach so far which is hindering or at least delaying the use of fakes in food production. And for reasons of transparency, it is important to me to emphasize that in first line, I'm a theologian and not an ethicist of technology or science, but I have repeatedly dealt with those questions in various areas in the course of my work. In the various contributions so far in the course of our webinar, we have already seen impressive testimonies about the consequences of listeriosis and heard a scientific assessment of the use of fakes to prevent the growth of listeria in food production. For the sake of order, I would like to summarize them once again. Listeriosis is a serious foodborne disease with a high hospitalization rate and an equally high mortality rate. This disease has been increasingly in recent years. People suffering from listeriosis who survive this disease often suffer from the consequences of the disease for the rest of their lives. We have seen this in the Dutch case. In food processing and production, it must be assumed that despite compliance with the highest standards of hygiene, such as those laid down by the European Union, the presence of listeria bacteria can never be completely ruled out. The presence of listeria in the food chain not only poses an immediate threat to consumers and their health, but also has economic consequences for food producers whose product is contaminated with listeria despite compliance with hygiene standards and has to be taken from the market. With fake specially targeted at listeria, as such as listed P100, we have a means of stopping the growth of listeria in food. The use of these fakes does not pose a risk to humans or the environment. Unlike antibiotics, it does not contribute to AMR. And the product has already been shown to be effective in the fight against listeriosis in several countries through its use in food protection. According to both scientists and the European Food Safety Agency, uh, fakes are a powerful tool that can help to significantly reduce the number of listeriosis cases and the death caused by this disease. Some figures speak of a reduction in the risk of infection or disease up to 99% in the cases seen to date. Taking into account the above, from the point of view of an ethical position centered on the protection of the human being and his dignity, the use of fakes in food production seems not only reasonable, but ethically commanded because if we have the means to prevent harm, we have an obligation to use them for the higher goal of saving lives. In its treaties, the European Union is committed to a tradition centered to the protection of the human being, his dignity and his rights. In Article 35 of the Charter of the European Union, the European Union defines health protection 
as a right of its citizens and undertakes to ensure a high level of human health protection in the definition and implementation of all its policies and activities. In view of this, the European Union has an obligation not to prevent the use of fakes, respectively, has the obligation to regulate it in such a way that the objective, the protection of the health of the citizens of the Union, can be achieved. The order of society through laws and regulation is a high good. However, they must comply with the principles of necessity, appropriateness, adequacy, practicability, trust, and communication. The process of their creation by the competent institutions must be transparent and comprehensible. Good legislation is an art, as the Dutch uh, lawyer Willem Wittefein stated. The latter, however, does not seem to be the case due to the European Commission's approach to regulate the use of List XP100 in the process of foodstuff production so far. Again, I would like to, uh, like, I just would like to briefly summarize what already has been said so far. The Commission's position on the submission for authorization of the product in food production to avoid contamination. The non-correction of a demonstrably incorrect classification of the product or the incorrect assessment of the product as a decontaminant. The termination of the approval process without indication when and how this process can be restarted. The obstruction of market assess without the prospect of a final assessment of the product. Requiring member states not to approve the product in food production. And the reluctance to work out what is probably the best solution to develop a separate regulation on the use of fakes in food production, which could also regulate the use of other fakes in similar cases, for example, against Salmonella or E. coli bacteria. To be fair, possible, though not explicitly stated, serious motives for this approach or lack of action by the European Commission should be considered too, and one already has been mentioned. The fear that by the use of bacteriophages, hygiene rules in the food production are being undermined or taken lightly, and this already has been denied by the scientists. The political fear that the authorization of the treatment of food with this XP100, bacteriophages, as we have heard, are viruses, will be classified by parts of the population as negative or undesirable and will be negatively credited on the European Union as a whole or the European Commission. Like from Brussels, it must be like this. Now our food is contaminated with viruses. As far as they can be verified, the reasons for the delay are political, administrative and bureaucratic. They are, however, provided the goodwill of all concerned and in the view of the urgency of the effort to prevent further diseases or death, surmountable and way less heavily compared with the consequences of the Commission's actions or inaction to date, in last consequence, the death of human beings. I would like to summarize and to conclude. From a scientific point of view, the use of fakes to stop the spread of listeria in food and RTE products makes sense. From an ethical point of view, it is commanded. It is harmless to the consumer and if politi politically desired, its use can be made transparent, for instance, by appropriate marking or labeling. A lack of hygiene in the food production chain cannot be covered up by the use of uh, fakes, uh, and um, as uh, fakes are not a decontaminant and can only be used against listeria, but not against other bacteria. The users of the, of the product in food production are deprived of a, a suitable means to fight a potentially fatal disease, which can have serious economic consequences in case of emergency. With its approach so far, the Commission not only fails to do what is required, but prevents it. From an ethical point of view, the Commission's reluctance to act for purely administrative or bureaucratic reasons is to be seen as a failure to provide assistance, which means that the death of a large number of people due to listeriosis is willingly accepted. Ethically, it is imperative that the administration ends this untenable and ethically unacceptable situation as soon as possible. It is up to the politicians, you, the members of the European Parliament, to draw your own conclusions from this and then act accordingly. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> uh, thank you so much um, um, for your very interesting and important uh, points and feed for uh, for our uh, topical debate. And as you said, it is uh, uh, the least areas is themselves is big enough uh, uh, a question, Michael. But it has even a bigger consequences for the future about the uses of eggs uh, in salmonella in many other uh, areas what we could use them. And I'm sure that with my good colleague Sarah, we will raise up this issue with the uh, Commission in the future. And we all together uh, will certainly come back with each other to, uh, together to, to, <clears throat> to discuss how we could solve the issues. But now, as promised, I've uh, gathered some uh, Q&As uh, that you have sent us. And I try to pick a, a bit different kind of a questions to different uh, uh, panelists and uh, try to uh, put them uh, uh, forward. And um, <clears throat> the first, uh, 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 I would start uh, with the issue uh, that uh, how can we be sure um, that the fakes uh, reads is really the listeria cell? Um, as we know, they are not actively uh, uh, themselves, they can't move. So isn't there a high uh, probability that the fakes will uh, will not act uh, uh, before uh, the uh, analytical enrichment process and uh, they, that they could even lead uh, to false negative laboratory tests? So how can we be sure and how much studies we have, um, uh, have uh, about this side? Who would like to pick up uh, the question, Frank, please? The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, um, it is indeed a very good question. Um, you, uh, if you apply these fake solutions, you really have to ensure that you are covering the whole surface of uh, the product that can get contaminated with Listeria. So uh, first of all, to ensure that you have to use high enough concentrations. Huh? And secondly, how industry is guaranteeing that is in fact they are performing tests with colorants uh, to see if their spraying technique is, is suitable to cover the whole surface of a certain food product that they want to be covered. And in this way, they are sure that indeed their technique and the moment they are applying fakes uh, indeed guarantees that the whole surface is covered with high enough of, of fakes. And in that way, you are sure that uh, when Listeria is getting in contact with the, with the product where fakes are present, that they meet each other and that the fakes will uh, kill the, the, the Listeria. But indeed, it's not like that, that. So you really need to apply it on a right moment eh, in the process and in a, in a, in a good way eh, to ensure that you are really covering the whole surface of, uh, of the treated product. And before we move forward, uh, Frank, still one question for you. Uh, do we have enough uh, research results out of this? Or do you think that we would need more European research to support this uh, evidence? Well, the, there is quite a lot of research done at the moment. Eh? Uh, but what we especially need more is more applicative uh, research. So we really need to look in different applications where uh, is the ideal way to apply it and at what concentrations and how to apply it eh, with what uh, technical means uh, because every product is different every process is different so there is still research needed for sure but let's say the efficacy of the technique on products for listeria uh, is in fact proven uh, that that is sure but it is mainly how to apply it in such in a, in a really efficient way uh, and in an appropriate way to ensure guarantee of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the process. Thank you. And then there's the next question uh, uh, for you, Mr. Papas uh, uh, Spiro. Uh, if we would use these fakes uh, in the food, uh, how would uh, they be categorized uh, according to your knowledge? Uh, how should they be categorized? Uh, should it be in novel food uh, regulation are they in the ingredients or food additives or processing aids or uh, how to label them? Uh, 
You really Please have to put your mic on. I'm sorry, uh, we can't hear you. I think that you your mic is still muted. It could be that the sound is off as well. Um, should we try another question, perhaps? Yes, maybe while you are trying to solve the technical uh, issue, we'll come back to you uh, after the next question. Uh, we'll uh, uh, move to the next question that uh, uh, reads, wondering what the panel thinks needs to be done to increase general public's understanding of fakes and their uses. And is there any histor historical reason why our knowledge about fakes is so limited, even though we know in some other cultures and areas like in, in Russia, for example, they are still in, in quite widely worse or better, I don't know, but they, anyway, more, more widely used. So why, why do we have this resistance? Well, I would like to answer the first part of the question. I think uh, it will uh, be very helpful when uh, the food industry will explain what they are doing. I think that, that uh, that's good for every uh, subject in, in food industry, but also when they apply fakes on products. Uh, I think you have to explain why, the, why you do that, this and how, how this actually works. So about the history, I wouldn't know. Maybe uh, the Vlieger. Professor yeah, well, maybe I can uh, give uh, an answer or my ideas about that. I think here in, in Europe, um, we have been using or we have been typically approaching this kind of stuff more in, with chemicals than with biological agents. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when you go to Russia, uh, they are already for a very long time, in fact, uh, thinking and using uh, biological ways to, to, uh, to deal with problems. Uh. So, but nowadays we clearly see, see a shift in Europe from chemicals to alternatives for chemicals, and now we see that the biological agents uh, are are getting uh, more attention, and I think it's uh, that is a good uh, a good thing. Thank you, thank you for both of you, and I'm a very great uh, supporter when we have adequate scientific evidence for this kind of a biological defense because it's more natural, it evolves like the uh, other side also. And uh, in the longer run, I'm much afraid to believe it than uh, just uh, uh, using uh, chemical solutions. So very happy to be part of this. And before we uh, move to the next question, uh, let's start, uh, try uh, to have a good connection with you, Spyro. Yes, do you hear me now? Now we hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, you remember sorry. the uh, question for you. How should we call the fakes? Yeah. So listen, uh, there is already an example uh, coming from international partners, uh, reliable ones. Uh, the US, uh, Australia, Switzerland, Canada already. I think Canada was the first. They have already adopted uh, 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 this uh, 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 Listex uh, product. Uh, and uh, they have qualified it, uh, acknowledged it, uh, recognized its use as uh, a non decontaminating processing aid. So there is already an indication. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, the uh, right one to give an answer to the question because it is an answer that has to be given by a scientist in the field. But uh, uh, for me and with my simple uh, analysis, I would say that uh, 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 this product is not uh, really uh, uh, like uh, uh, other products uh, they are used to according to the regulation invoked by the Commission. And this is the regulation 853 of 2004. Uh, uh, the Commission, uh, yeah, from uh, what I have understood, uh, 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 first uh, was uh, favorable to recognize uh, the use of listic as a decontaminant, 
I asked myself why, and the answer I could give was that there is a specific legal basis that would enable the Commission to proceed accordingly. That shows that the Commission was inclined to acknowledge the use of the product and uh, it used one existing legal basis. I'm afraid that uh, this legal basis misled uh, the Commission and qualified uh, the product as a decontaminant. Uh, mm. Now, uh, this legal basis, to my understanding, is uh, applicable only in slaughtering houses. They use uh, water, clean water or potable water, to uh, uh, on the surfaces uh, of the carcasses. Uh, I don't uh, think that uh, this is uh, the right legal basis for the very simple reason that uh, Listex is applied uh, on food that is not uh, already contaminated. Uh, mm. Okay, while uh, this legal basis addresses uh, 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 food. Uh, 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 food uh, deriving from animal that is already contaminated and uh, in this way they are trying at, at the end of the day to apply EGN rules, that's all. It is very different in the case of Listeria, but I repeat, uh, of, of Listex. I repeat, uh, it is rather for Professor De Fliegere to, uh, to, to, to address uh, this question. Maybe we can, uh, can come back to this question later on. But I was just thinking, could we use the novel food regulation here as well uh, and treat this as uh, uh, some other uh, food additives, for example? Um, because we know that, for example, what you call them, the lactobacteria, uh, they do have this kind of a features as well, not so strong than the fogs, but it can be used as, as sort of a, uh, a curbing down the bacteria. The, uh, uh, a negative bacteria increase, and there's a, a bit the same debate. Where do you categorize that? What do you call it? Yeah, if you allow me, I think that uh, there are uh, alternative solutions to address the problem. Uh, the Commission could, for instance, uh, uh, acknowledge that this is a processing aid, as it is uh, acknowledged uh, in uh, uh, the other uh, international partners. In this way. In this way, the product could be authorized at the national level. It is not anymore, according to the food additives regulation, it does not fall under uh, 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 an authorization from uh, the union. It is uh, a matter of the national uh, authorities, as it was until recently, and it is always, I assume this is a foggy area, uh, for instance, the Netherlands recognized it uh, as a non decontaminated processing gain since a long time ago, and others. Now, this is one, to acknowledge it as a processing aid period. And in this way, a solution is given until a phage regulation, which is indispensable, is adopted after careful consideration. Another way is to invoke uh, the basic uh, uh, health. Uh, article of the treaty, which uh, I remind you, uh, uh, requests or addresses or imposes uh, for the Union uh, the obligation to ensure high level uh, of health protection. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, by analogy of the regulation 853, uh, uh, give uh, 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 an extraordinary uh, uh, authorization uh, for the product. Uh, as I said before, it is more a matter of political will than of a legal basis. Just a recent example is what uh, the president of the European Union, Mrs. von der Leyen, stated, uh, I think, uh, just a few days ago regarding uh, the fight against the uh, 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 coronavirus uh, and uh, by uh, 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 ensuring quick authorizations for a vaccine to be produced by a company, Kuravec, uh, Kuravec, I think it is called in Germany. And not only that, it has been also financed. Well done. It has to be addressed. There is political will. So, uh, I mean, it is uh, uh, a matter that it is covered entirely by the, by the Treaty of the Union and the 
the accompanying uh, directives. Uh, the union law could be interpreted to fill in a gap and give the possibility uh, for uh, an authorization uh, uh, that is indispensable at this uh, very moment. Mm. Thank you very much. That was very useful uh, advice and uh, useful uh, interpretation. Um, then uh, my next question, we still have a couple of minutes time for questions. Uh, uh, here uh, is, is to Dr. Kuhn and it reads, since Listeria is omnipresent in the environment and so is found in many uh, primary products like fresh meat, uh, um, and pro, uh, produce. Do you think we have to educate consumers better which risks can arise from primary products? And this is uh, addressed to uh, Sarah and my uh, myself also. But I'm I'm, I'm going to comment uh, comment it on when I'm concluding this uh, Q and A session. I think this is, uh, links a little bit not to the last but the one but last question. But I think um, education and transparency are in then, is this indispensable because we need this, that people know what it is. As I already referred to, people are afraid of what they do not really know and they not really can place. And I think there is a need to make clear what it does, what it does not does, so why there is no harm, and that people understand uh, finally why it makes sense to use it. And I think this is also a task um, for administration to help and perhaps also to finance uh, the, 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 the necessary uh, communication about uh, not only the product but about fakes as such. That would be help that this is accepted by the population as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Yes, uh, on my behalf and Sarah probably is going to comment then uh, later on. The, the question is that, yes, of course, we would need to educate people about these risks, like the other risks, but not only about the risks, but the solutions as well, and what the good the fakes are doing, because otherwise you are just threatening people. Now you can't eat uh, uh, carrots out of the uh, uh, field directly without cooking, because you might, you can't eat your fish, you can't uh, uh, eat your fresh cheese or basically what else and this is not the right way on my opinion but sort of to understand how to uh, eliminate and minimize the risk and uh, how to use fakes and healthy uh, other procedures to, to minimize the risk. Uh, then uh, there's a, a one question um, I'm, I'm going to uh, pose it even though I think that the question answer is very definite and short, uh, but the question says, is, is it correct to uh, say that fakes do not contribute to antimicrobial resistance? Who would like to comment on this? Frank, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I think this is indeed a, a correct statement. Eh? Um, it is known, in fact, that uh, that fakes do not contribute to to antimicrobial resistance, uh, like, uh, for example, chemical compounds are uh, are doing. So uh, it's in fact a big advantage of on the long term also eh, of using the fakes. Uh, it's more sustainable to do it uh, to use fakes uh, because on the long term. We are sure that uh, that there is still work. Um, moreover, we can in day, indeed also play with cocktails of fakes, uh, and the cocktail can evaluate as a function of time. So when we see that uh, a certain uh, strains come up, uh, that then we, we ca the, 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 the cocktail can be adapted uh, to uh, to ensure that uh, that the cocktail is working. So uh, yes. Uh, I, th I think it's a, a real advantage of using the fakes. Mm. Yes, yeah, I, right. yeah, I would like just to build on that uh, and say that uh, from this point of view, in fact, uh, uh, the product uh, is compatible with uh, the very recent uh, policy of uh, the European Commission regarding uh, the uh, from farm to fork. One of the 
objectives is that uh, it does not uh, uh, contribute to antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance. Yeah, uh, so this is really a very important uh, aspect of the product. Yes, this is good news. So thank you. And Michael, please. Yeah, and this also from the ethical point of view uh, supports the use of the product because uh, it does less harm. It does less harm to the environment than other means would do. So from that point of view, it is also desirable to use it. Exactly. Then there's still uh, one last question and then one for, for us MEPs. And uh, the last question for you is, uh, who makes fakes except the micros? And Frank, do you know the answer? Uh, I don't know all producers, uh, but I know there are others uh, producing it. I know there is an, uh, also a German company uh, specialized in fake uh, production. Uh, so they are not the only one, um, but uh, I could I think in Europe uh, they are the one that maybe are standing the farthest in applications. Um, but uh, they are not the only one. There are other European countries or our companies, sorry, that are producing it, and uh, most in other parts of the world. Thank you. And this uh, sort of a competitiveness and level playing field is of course very important point of view but quite often when we have new technologies there's first one or two companies doing it but certainly then when it is legal when it is allowed so you see suddenly blooming industry that is providing mm -hmm. the solution so i i i'm not uh, worried about the case that it would be only in ha hands of one or two companies in the then uh, before thanking the panelists and turning to sarah the uh, question uh, for us is, how do the MEPs plan to promote the use of fakes in, in the industry? Do they have any plans regarding use in humans as medicines against bacterial infections? And I think that there's a growing uh, awareness and interest in the parliament to uh, learn more about this subject, to learn the right avenues do we need and what kind of a specific fakes regulation do we need to go and uh, uh, have first approval of a certain fakes in certain uses? Uh, what kind of a, a broad uh, a roadmap we, we need to sort of uh, add, uh, make this as an additive on human medication and to uh, compensate a certain medications even in some cases and how this can be a part of microbial resistance and um, now on my uh, turn, I would like to thank you uh, for this panel. Uh, of course, our wonderful panelists for I, I learned a great deal for your wonderful inten, uh, in, in men, interventions, and I'm sure I'm going to be in contact with you. And now back to Sarah, and I'm sure we are, co uh, we are going to continue working with, with this subject in the future, uh, how we can. Uh, uh, fight against listeriosis and uh, the uh, progress, the use of fakes in the European Union. On my behalf, thank you and all the best. And Sarah, to you. Thank you, Sirpa. Thank you, all um, the experts. I learned a lot uh, myself. As I've said during the meeting, the MAP interest group on and to microbial resistance, we should pay more attention to the potential of use of fake uh, to boost health protection in the EU and, uh, as you said, more sustainable. Um, I think in the EU should not lose uh, out on the potential benefits of such technologies, but because of a missing regulatory framework. COVID-19 uh, uh, took us by surprise and we are paying a tragic price for that. But issues like listeriosis and increasing antimicrobial resistance are already well known. We must do more to prevent outbreaks of foodborne listeriosis. And if there is an alternative available that does not depend on the use of antibiotics, we should investigate this option further and not let bureaucratic obstacles stop us as in the case we say today 
So I think this is very important. So I really think we had a very interesting discussion on this important topic today and i would like to thank all of the participants and listeners for taking the time to be with us today and uh, again i thank you and all the best and i hope you stay healthy and well in the next time thank you and bye bye <laughs>